Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing the ethnic cleansing of Palestine with Professor Ilan Pape, who is the director of the European Center for Palestine Studies and a senior fellow of the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, UK. Pape is the author of 20 books. His two most recent are Our Vision for Liberation with Ramzi Baroud and The Historical Dictionary of Palestine with Johnny Mansour. His most known work is the 2006 book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. And he also co-authored two books with Noam Chomsky. Ilan Pape, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for coming on. So uh, let's talk about the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Uh, it, it seems to me one of the biggest events in world history that that outside of Palestine uh, is still pretty much left out of basic history lessons. Uh, am I am I right about that? Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. Although. Of course, Palestinians wrote about it, talked about it for many years, and most Palestinians know uh, uh, what happened in 1948. 74 years later, uh, the denial of uh, what happened uh, is still widespread, quite surprisingly, uh, even among uh, educated uh, and very well-informed uh, uh, people. Uh, and uh, this is not just um, a case of not knowing the facts. This is denying, uh, in my mind at least, of a crime that was committed against the Palestinian people. And as you know, for people who were victims of a crime, the crime itself is a big trauma. But if the crime is denied, the, 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 uh, the trauma is even uh, bigger and, and much more uh, profound. So uh, in that case, uh, that was my hope when I wrote the book that if I would define it more clearly as a crime according to, to uh, scholarly literature, definitions of the United Nation, even of the American State Department, if I, if I would use their definitions for ethnic cleansing and prove that this is indeed the best way to frame what happened in 1948, my great hope was that people would understand that they should know what happened there, not just for the sake of knowledge, but because by that they would recognize and acknowledge a crime that was committed against the people of Palestine. Is there is there anything else like it anywhere else in the world in the past hundred years of most of the people of a country being driven out or killed, houses burned, water poisoned, and so forth that that's omitted from history? Uh, I mean, this is this is rather unique, right? It is unique, especially because it happened after the Second World War. I mean, I suppose if you go to the 19th century, uh, <laughs> David, I hate to bring it up, but even in your own country, I mean, right here, uh, you know, exactly. I mean, genocides happened and were not always recognized, not always acknowledged. But after the Second World War, and in fact, because of the uh, what happened in the Second World War, it was very difficult to hide uh, atrocities of such a magnitude uh, anywhere else in the world. It's even after writing, and I've written 20 books, I must admit, even after writing so many books, it's still a conundrum for me, a, 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 apart from the fact that I'm trying to explain this conundrum and I'm doing my best, it's still a conundrum how such an, uh, a crime was denied for so many years. How could it be hidden? from the public eye and the political eye, especially in the West and in particular in the United States, when we're talking about the age, all right, there was no television, there was no internet, but there was radio. Uh, the most important newspapers in America had uh, correspondence embedded with the Israeli forces. The United Nations had emissaries uh, on the spot. Uh, the International Red Cross uh, had its own delegates there. And in fact, I use the reports, even of the American reporters, to unfold what happened. But I know that the editors in chief of the American newspapers did not want to publish these, uh, this information 
about the crimes committed against the Palestinians in 1948 and preferred to buy into the Israeli narrative that Israel was a small David protecting itself against a, a brutal uh, a Goliath uh, and doing nothing wrong in its war of independence and self-defense. It seems like World War II was a turning point because uh, not both sides, but at least one side was prosecuted uh, for its crimes uh, under the Hague Conventions on the Pacific Settlement of Disputes, under the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, these being laws that are still in place and could still be used. But when you talk about the crime of ethnic cleansing, are you talking about later laws and are you talking about laws that were on the books in 1948? Yes, that, that's a very good question. In 1948, international law did not yet define uh, ethnic cleansing as a crime against uh, humanity. Uh, uh, there was a much better understanding about uh, the crime of ethnic cleansing after the wars in ex-Yugoslavia in the uh, early 1990s. Uh, but it was already clear that if you unpack ethnic cleansing, namely if you are talking about mass expulsion of people, about massacres, of poisoning their, their water, of burning the, their houses, not allowing them to return, the international law had enough, especially the human right international law, had enough clauses in it to uh, uh, allow the international community to condemn Israel and do its best to stop now, the main problem, or it's not the main problem, but an additional problem, I would say, is that the ethnic cleansing, because the ethnic cleansing of 1948 was not acknowledged by the world in 1948, the message for Israel was that if you were unable to complete the ethnic cleansing, and they were unable to complete the ethnic cleansing, they expelled half of the population, but it means that half of the population remained, that you can continue and try and complete the ethnic cleansing because it seems that the international community and especially the part of the international community that matters, the West, uh, seems to accept ethnic cleansing when it comes to Israel, although it would condemn it probably anywhere else uh, on the globe. And that's what happened. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine, not on the same magnitude of 1948, has never stopped until the, the very time that we are speaking uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, in this month, in this year, uh, people in the West at least are aware of the ethnic cleansing of parts of Jerusalem, of uh, parts of the West Bank, uh, but this has never stopped for one day. Sometimes the victim is only one person, sometimes the victim is a whole village, but uh, the basic ideology that believes that the less Arabs you have within what is Israel at a given moment, the better it is for Israel. And all the means are justified to ensure this demographic exclusivity, and if not exclusivity, at least a firm majority. I should say that this incredible book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, by our guest, Ilan Pape, documents in detail, chronologically, village by village, the, the atrocities and the fact that the people engaged in them used the term cleansing themselves uh, and that it perfectly fits any definition of horrific genocidal uh, brutality. Uh, did publishing this book make a difference? Has putting these facts in specific documented details in front of people uh, made a difference over these, these years since 2006? I think if it made a difference, and, and this is, I'm content with it, I think it helped uh, sections of the civil society in, in the West in particular, but also in some other parts of the world to have a more accurate terminology, a more accurate vocabulary for describing what happened. And I know I, I got tens of thousands of emails over and letters over the years of people who told me that the book changed their attitude towards Palestine. So, so I think it did manage to expand the already existing, one should say, solidarity network with the Palestinians and people who care about Palestine. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think either this book or similar excellent books that appeared before or after has managed so far to change the 
views of political elites in the West or in particular in America about the situation. Uh, and uh, of course, the biggest failure, or maybe it's not a failure because it's uh, impossible, it didn't change uh, the Israeli attitude towards the Palestinians, which is my biggest disappointment. Although I must say, this is why I wrote it in English. I, I didn't expect my uh, interlocutors to be the Israelis. I really want, I, at least I thought people around the world should be uh, uh, our, in a dialogue about that atrocity, the continued atrocities, and think aloud with me, what can we do to stop them? I, th I think a lot of minds are changing, thank goodness, not enough, but a lot. Um, it, it seems that something else that's been denied uh, is the role of the US and Western nations uh, in refusing to admit Jews and those threatened by the Nazis in World War II uh, and, and the role that that refusal played in the death of those people. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, you've looked into this and you can't figure it out, so I know I can't, but it <laughs> seems that uh, it, it seems that the notion that this was somehow the anti-Holocaust, that these were the victims of the Holocaust, therefore nothing they did could possibly be anything other than righteous. Uh, plus, the retelling of the story, not as a war or a genocide, but as the creation of a nation. Plus, ever since 1967, the the insistence on most people I talked to, to go back to 67 to find crimes by Israel, but nothing before that date exists in the, chrono in the chronology of crimes. It seems that these, th these are all ways in which uh, it's been buried. Uh, am I, am yes, I right? I, yeah, you, you're right. Uh, we can un unpack a few of the points you, you made here, maybe, maybe expand on them a bit. Let's start with the, the you're absolutely right, with a categorical, uh, um, I would almost say inhuman policy uh, let's focus on the United States and Britain uh, in disallowing uh, Jewish refugees to enter in large numbers uh, for whatever reasons or whatever rhetoric, we don't have to go into it. The fact is important here. Uh, the Jews, uh, most of the Jews in Europe prefer to go to Britain and America if they could, not to Palestine, but uh, the West closed its gates. And that's a fact that should be taught in schools and, and so on, because we are facing another anti-refugee uh, attitude in America and other places towards people who are no less in need of refuge and, and life-seeking people. And it's only racism that prevents uh, uh, their full uh, integration and acceptance. Um, the second point you're making is absolutely uh, crucial. Most of the, the Jews who either as commanders or as troopers who took place in the atrocities were not Holocaust survivors. <laughs> they were Jews who arrived long before the Second World War. Most of them were there uh, out of ideological reasons, not as an antidote to the Holocaust because it happened before the Holocaust. And, um, and it was, uh, they, they were in Palestine for the same reason that pe people from Britain and Europe came to, the, to North America. Uh, many years before that, or to Australia, or to South Africa. These were Europeans who were definitely not accepted by many other Europeans, and in many ways were forced to leave, but unfortunately chose other people's homelands to build a new Europe in them, and in the process uh, uh, regarded the indigenous people as the main obstacle, and in many cases genocided them or ethnically cleansed them. So this was a typical set Zionism in this regard is not different from any other settler colonial movement that uh, dispossessed uh, indigenous people around the world, uh, uh, dis displacing them and then replacing them uh, 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 in, in the process. Um, the, the third point uh, that is very important to, to, to remember in, in this respect is that the uh, Holocaust was used uh, in order to justify the dispossession of the Palestinians. It was not the reason the Palestinians were dispossessed, but it was manipulated as a reason. And, um, and in many ways, if you, if you look at it, it's a bit of an abuse of the Holocaust memory to use the genocide of the Jews in Europe 
to justify the ethnic cleansing of the of the Palestinians. Um, it was uh, uh, instead of dealing at least genuinely and humanly with a real conundrum, Jews are running away from Europe, and some of them find uh, uh, Palestine as a safe haven. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, and they are accepted by the local population as guests, as immigrants who are seeking a, a refuge. But you cannot come as a refuge and say, actually, you, the hosts, are the aliens. I'm the alien. I'm actually the real owner of the land. And if you're not accepting it, I will expel you. So instead of really finding a way by which also Palestine, and there was Palestinian readiness for that, that also Palestine, like any other places, would be part of the places where Jews would find a safe, at least a temporary safe haven until the end of the Second World War, and maybe a permanent home later on, uh, uh, if they don't want to come to the new Europe that was built after 1945. And the last point I want to make about it, David, is very important. Europe never dealt properly with the Holocaust to this very day. It never dealt properly uh, with the fact that it was not just Germany that took part in the, in the, in the destruction, not only of Jews, of, of uh, gypsies, of Romans, and many other people, uh, gay people, and a lot of other people that the Nazis uh, regarded as inhuman or infrahuman. Uh, from Hungary, uh, the SS in Hungary, the SS in Romania, the SS even in Sweden, these in Holland, in Belgium. I mean, there's so many other countries that had to reckon with their enthusiasm for fascism, for their enthusiasm for racism, that we, we have to rewrite the ge genealogy of racism in Europe. We haven't done it yet. Uh, it was much easier to say, oh, the Holocaust is over because we support the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. We, we compensated fully for the genocide of the Jews by supporting the uh, dispossession of the Palestinians, so to speak. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is what they did. Instead, for instance, committing and making every effort to convince the Jews of Europe as, and the Jews of America, which was a better project, absolutely was a better project than Jews in Europe, that Europe will never be again the, the Europe of the Second World War, and therefore Jews should stay there and be part of building a new democratic, uh, uh, free, uh, and just uh, Europe. It was much easier not to deal. And look, look what happens if you don't deal with the essence of racism in Europe. It comes back again. It comes back again. I mean, this, this horrific story in Germany where the, they wanted to recreate uh, the Reich of course, it's, it's, it's an, a, a small group of hallucinators, but nonetheless, it shows you that you have not uprooted the basic racism uh, and anti-Semitism and now also Islamophobia. So, so I think it's, uh, 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 it's important to tell the story in a way that also explains manipulations and fabrications um, in order to understand that Europe decided that the Palestinians would be the victim so that it doesn't have to deal with the crime it committed against the Jewish people during the Second World War. Well, it, it's, it sounds good to uh, compensate the Jewish people, except that there were people already living there. Exactly. Uh, and so this makes my next question a tricky one, of course. What about the right of return uh, for the Palestinians and their millions of descendants, and what about the people who stole their land and their millions of descendants, legally and morally? What is what is proper here? Yeah, absolutely, and I, I agree. It's a it's a, it's a complicated question, but it has to be dealt on two levels. There is the principle level, and there is the practical. On a principle level. Uh, the right of the Palestinian refugees and then descend and their descendants to return to Palestine should never be questioned. It should be fully supported on a moral basis, legal basis, and political basis. That's on a moral, uh, of you want the principle uh, level. Practically, there are many uh, mechanisms. Uh, by the way, already uh, summarized very well by the United Nations in 2005, 
in a document called the Pinero uh, Principles that shows exactly that there is a mechanism by which people who return to a place from which they were expelled into a, a place where their homes were destroyed or their homes were taken by other uh, people, there is a very clear, complicated, but very clear process of either compensation, reinstitution, re, uh, 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 and, and so on that has to be worked out. I'm not saying it would be easy, but it's doable. It's definitely doable. But I don't think that the issue of how to implement the right of return for the Palestinians begins with the fact that practically it's a complicated issue and it would take time to work out the mechanism. Now, I think the problem lies elsewhere. The problem is that Israel as it is now is a racist state. And because of Jewish racism in Israel, Palestinian refugees are not allowed to return. Not because there's a problem of economic capacity or there's not enough space for them to settle. I mean, Israel accepted 1 million uh, so-called Jews from Russia, 1 million, and, and easily absorb them. I say so-called Jews because half of these uh, uh, Russian Jews, I saw them praying in Haifa uh, on Sundays in the churches near my house. So I know how Jewish they, they were. Um, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a member of racism. If the whole notion that whoever lives in what is historical Palestine should be treated equally, regardless of their nationality, religion or gender, then the idea of people coming back home would be less threatening and less uh, an issue and would be dealt only practically, but not on a moral or political level. Uh, so unless you kind of de-Zionize Israel, you can never uh, expect a full implementation of the right of return, by the way, that the United Nations recognized in Resolution 194. Uh, and, and all in all, modern Israel and Palestine needs to be decolonized. And decolonization, we know it from the past, is not an easy process. It can be quite messy, can be quite murky but it's a necessary process if you want to create a just a, a regime here in the future. Uh, after 100 years of, well, not 100 years, sorry, I'm exaggerating. After 74 years of Jews having all the privileges, all the possessions, all the power, it would be very difficult for many of them to give it up. Look at the white minority in South Africa. They were not very enthusiastic of undergoing such a process. But these are inevitable processes. And, and, and return by whoever wants to return is part of that decolonization, is part of building a just future, which would be, in the end of the day, better also for the Jews who live in what today is Israel and, and Palestine. So, so what, Ilan Pape, what should we be demanding uh, be done? Uh, first step immediately uh, now to, to move us towards uh, actually implementing the right of return and justice for uh, everyone in Palestine. Well, we, luckily uh, the Palestinian civil society showed us the way when about uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it initiated something which is called the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction uh, uh, Movement, the BDS movement, uh, that calls for the civil society to support boycott of Israel until Israel fulfills three basic rights, the rights of the Palestinians not to live under military occupation and siege, the right of the Palestinian citizens of Israel not to live under apartheid, and the right of the refugees to return. Now, we see already an expansion of the B and the D in the BDS, mainly the many campaigns of boycott and divestment, including by trade unions and churches in America, which really uh, is, is a fantastic uh, phenomenon. We don't have the S in the BDS. We don't have sanctions. Uh, but anyone who studies uh, the campaign against apartheid in South Africa, the solidarity movement outside South Africa with the ANC would remember that it started with boycotts and divestment and took quite a while for governments to join in with imposing sanctions. I, I think that our role now is to make sure that the governments understand that the wide sections of the civil society, including in the United States, 
would support a tougher policy towards Israel and would support this policy not just on the principle of morality, but because as we speak every day, the Israeli forces kill three to five Palestinians, many of them children or young people. So it's not just a matter of setting an historical record right, it's a matter of stopping the destruction of the people uh, uh, with the help of American financial aid, moral aid, and political aid. I think that uh, the American public in particular, but this is true about other governments as well, of course, I'm not just <laughs> lying it all in the American, need to, to, uh, to at least to react to the situation in Palestine in the way it reacted to the situation in the Ukraine. The hypocrisy between the two case studies, I'm not going to go into the, the cynical American involvement in that story anyway, but, but at least the public, and I understand it, the compassionate public response to what happens to the Ukrainian people, at least that should be reflected no understanding that whatever the Ukrainians are suffering, the Palestinians have been suffering for almost uh, 70 to 80 years. So, so this is something we should all strive uh, to do in the places we are if we are outside of Palestine. We, we have just about two minutes left. It does seem that long before we get to U.S. sanctions on the Israeli government, we ought to be able to ask U.S. newspapers to cover Palestinian victims as if they were Ukrainians, to ask the U.S. government not to give billions of dollars of free weapons, not to protect uh, every Israeli crime in international uh, fora, not to, uh, not to defend and support uh, Israel uh, any more than any other government in the world. I mean, we these seem reasonable demands to be making now, right? Absolutely. And in one minute, I would say that there are good news and bad news in this. The good news is that in every passing day, David, I know of more people who share this idea in America. I know it. I, I feel it. I also have data that shows that this is. We have more and more people who understand the message that you have just conveyed, and. The, the bad news is that we haven't, we, we are not powerful enough to impact the situation on the ground as yet. So all of us, I think, should double and triple our efforts uh, and be aware that we are convincing more and more people and the efforts should continue because I think in the end of the day, it will have an impact on the situation on the ground. I certainly hope so. I think it's beginning to already. Uh, we've been speaking with Ilan Pape, who is the director of the European Center for Palestine Studies and a senior fellow of the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Uh, read his books. We will have links up at talkworldradio.org. And one of those books is this one, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Ilan Pape, thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, David, for having me. It was a great uh, pleasure uh, to talk to you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.